Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Job. Uh, tonight we'll start with chapter 35, verse 1, and we'll see how far we can go in one hour here. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies on Job, uh, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So before we get started in Job, uh, let me ask uh, Brother Eric and Brother Stephen to introduce themselves. Hello, it's me again, the homo. Okay. Hey everybody, Brother Stephen here again, known on YouTube as Stephen Rivers TV. You know, enjoying fellowship and studying tonight, and we definitely pray that we reach out to some people tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate you brothers joining me, and I hope that uh, whoever's watching this video will subscribe to their YouTube channels. Uh, all right, let's get started. Job chapter 35, verse 1 in the KJV, because I'm a KJV firstist. Uh, Elihu spake moreover and said, Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou sayest, My righteousness is more than God's? For thou saidst, what advantage will it be unto thee, and what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? I will answer thee, and thy companions with thee. Look unto the heavens, and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than thou. If thou sinnest, what do doest thou against him? Or if thy transgressions be multiplied, what doest thou unto him? If thou be righteous, what givest thou him, or what receiveth he of thine hand? Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the son of man. By reason of the multitude of oppressions, they make the oppressed to cry. They cry out by reason of the arm of the mighty. But none saith, Where is God my maker, who giveth songs in the night, who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth, and maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven. There they cry, but none giveth answer, because of the pride of evil men. Surely God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. Although thou sayest thou shalt not see him, yet judgment is before him, therefore trust thou in him. But now, because it is not so, he hath visited his ang visited in his anger, yet he knoweth it not in great extremity. Therefore doth Job open his mouth in vain. He multiplieth words without knowledge. Okay, uh, we've kind of played a little game here with Job recently where I read the chapter in the KJV, and then I ask you to give the chapter a title. You see, the, in the KJV translation, it doesn't, uh, the, the publishers uh, and the translators did not ascribe a title to a chapter. Uh, but in other translations, some of the, sometimes you will find that they, the titles, the chapters are titled. Uh, we're going to look at it in the Amplified, and it, it, it does give a title for the chapter. So rather than telling you what the title is, I'd ask you to give the, give the chapter a title before I reveal the, the title in the Amplified. So go ahead with that. Okay. Now, uh, can I ask one favor? Can you tell me the title of the previous chapter? Yeah, the previous chapter is Elihu Vindicates God. Okay. No, no, no. Elihu Vindicates God's Justice. Oh, right. I scored on that one, didn't I? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, 
I think this one is uh, uh, God's mercy and truth. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Well, I guess. I guess for me, just personally, especially looking at the end of it, I would just say he's calling Job out for vanity. You know, Eli, who is. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the title in the Amplified is Elihu Sharply Reproves Job. Um, he's really been, been doing that uh, all along. Uh, the, all of the visitors have been reproving Job. So um, you could probably just about get, put that title for any of the chapters, but... Uh, uh, okay, um, let me read the, the beginning of it in the Amplified, and, and uh, then we'll start talk, discussing it. Elihu continued speaking to Job and said, Do you think this is according to your justice? Do you say, My righteousness is more than God's? For you say, What advantage uh, have you by living a righteous life? What profit will I have? more by being righteous than if I had sinned. That's verse 1, 2, and 3. So let me ask you to respond to that. Uh, I'm having trouble keeping up. Uh, go ahead, guys. Okay, well, I feel like, you know, just looking at this, it's just really you just see him kind of really calling him out for, at least from his perspective of thinking that Job might be calling himself, you know, more righteous than God, you know, with what, and just using kind of, you know, his own words, you know, against him early kind of in these, in these first few verses. Okay, well, let's examine this first three verses more slowly here. Elihu continued speaking to Job and said, so Elihu's diatribe, his, his tirade, his rantings against Job continue. And he says to Job, do you think this is according to your justice? In other words, your view of what justice is? Do you say, my righteousness is more than God's? In other words, you think you're better than God? For you say, what advantage have you by living a righteous life? What profit will I have more by being righteous than if I had sinned? So, in other words, Elihu is speaking for Job. He's saying, Job, this is what your, your position is. And you're, you, you believe that um, you know more than God and that God is uh, uh, being unjust and, and uh, you're... you're uh, uh, you're completely righteous, you're completely innocent, and, and you don't deserve the bad things that are happening to you. And, and you're saying it's unfair, God's unjust, uh, and um, if that's the case, if you're not going to reap what you sow, because that's the, that's the principle that they think should apply here, if, you, if you're a, a wicked person, then God will will, uh, you know, um, uh, make you pay for that. Uh, if, if you're a, a righteous person doing good things, then God's going to bless you uh, for that. So that's the rule that they expect to, to, to apply to this situation. And so Job, Elihu is claiming that Job is saying, well, that the rule of uh, uh, reaping and sowing isn't applying here. I, I guess there is no law of reaping and sowing because I've been good and look why I'm being cursed. I might as well just be a sinner. So that, that's what how Elihu is representing Job's sentiments. Do you think that Job uh, really feels that way? Uh, or or um, and, and also, why is this accusation against Job, is it, is it true? Is it, is it a valid point or is there some kind of a uh, uh, you know, um, is it misplaced? Well, it's definitely misplaced. There's no doubt about it. But now, uh, the first part of your question was what again?
is, is he correctly see he's saying job you you're saying this is oh. he correctly representing job's true feelings no uh what that's ridiculous uh he has a very harsh condemnation in those first three verses i finally uh the penny finally dropped okay i'm i'm having a little bit of difficulties cuz uh i'm really excited about all the good news uh that's been happening uh here in uh magic fairy dust land okay back to you uh okay well i would think it's definitely a misplaced thing because as we saw you know at the start of this job was righteous and he got caught in a bet between god and the devil and you know the devil is doing all this to him because god had said that you know he was a great servant but like looking at I feel like, I guess personally, I would say that Elihu was kind of putting words in Job's mouth as of right now. But we'll dive into more of this as we keep going on. Yeah, I, I think uh, when you start speaking for someone else, I, I, maybe you've had this happen to you. I know I have, where, you know, I, I present my thoughts on something. And then someone else says, "Well, Brother Luke believes this," and they're they're totally misrepresenting what I believe, or they're they're at least not representing it exactly right. Uh, and I think this is kind of what's happening here. He he's he's exaggerating Job's feelings, even though Job is confused. We know. We, I asked you if this this is misplaced. Uh, this uh, this. Uh, this accusations against Job. No, it's it's, it's misplaced. They shouldn't be blaming Job if they knew the truth. And that's why, you know, one of the um, one of the principal rules of Bible study is context. Um, it it is either the first or second most important principle that we need to always keep in mind as we study the scriptures. I believe another one that's a contender for, for importance is is uh, the uh, the number and weight number and uh, clarity of scriptures. In other words, if you have a lot of scriptures that are real clear, saying something, that should outweigh you know a, a few scriptures that you know are confusing. Everybody's arguing about what it means. You don't you don't base your doctrines and your conclusions on a few verses that are unclear and everybody's arguing over. You base your doctrine on on the verses that are absolutely clear. So, uh, in this case, though, with Job, it, it, I don't know if I can think of another book in the whole Bible where context is, is, would be more important. Because if a, if a person does not keep the first two chapters in context throughout the remainder of Job, then they're going to come to the wrong conclusions the way his friends have have, have come to the wrong conclusions. As Brother Stephen said, uh, no, this this uh, accusations against Job are misplaced because Job really is an innocent man. He really is a righteous man. These problems Job is, is dealing with are not a result of him being wicked. They're not a result of God punishing him. But that's what they're assuming, because they don't know what happened in chapter one and two. So if if you're watching this now, th I'm trying to tell you this is so important to go back and watch it from the beginning, because in the very beginning you'll you'll see that God is singling out Job out of every person in the whole world as the as the best example of of good of a good man, someone who really loves God, and and. Uh, He's picking him, and and because Satan says there's no good man, there's no one that really loves you, so they set up this. Satan says, I, I'll I'll prove it to you. Let me do a, b bad things to him, and and I'll show you that he will curse you. He doesn't really love you, so God permits it, but God is not doing it to him, and 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 even though God permits it, it's not because Job's wicked. It's be, he's he's the most righteous man. So that's why there's so much confusion over this book, because people are not keeping the first two chapters totally in perspective throughout the rest of the study. And if you do that, 
you can run the risk of coming to some horribly wrong conclusions on your doctrine. Okay, let me ask you guys to respond about to that before we go on. Wow, there's a lot of good information in there. Uh, I don't know how to quite respond to it, though. Uh, but, uh, okay. Yeah, context is, like, extremely important. And, you know, all throughout Scripture and, of course, like, in every teaching that you do. Because if you, like, misinterpret, like, anything and then, like, teach it, it can really, really confuse a lot of people and, like, really throw a lot of people off. I mean, you'll see a, a lot of, stuff like, things that I see where people misinterpret things. It's definitely in, like, the gospel presentation, which is the worst thing you can ever mess up. But, like, it doesn't matter, though. Like, especially here in Job, like, if you don't read the first two, you're not going to understand, you know, what's going on here and that he really is innocent. But it's, like... If you just like can't really understand like the gospel in context and then you know misinterpret it to you know say something else and then preach that it will just like it just confuses like everybody that's listening and it really will throw people off and it's just it's just not good for people in their walk because it's just making you stumble and you know making you be you know I'm talking about for the gospel one here because it also just make you very insecure in everything in your own salvation when that's not like what it's supposed to be but in cases like this. You just don't understand really what's going on here, and that Job really isn't. And that's all I have on this one. All right, we'll move on to the next verse four. It says, and and this is Elihu continuing. He says, "I will answer you and your companions with you. Look to the heavens and see, and behold the skies, which are much higher than you. If you have sinned, what do you accomplish against him?" And if your transgressions are multiplied, what have you done to him? If you are righteous, what do you give God? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects only a man such as you, and your righteousness affects only a son of man, but it cannot affect God who is sovereign. Okay, I'll stop there after verse 8 and let you respond to that. Uh, forgive me, guys. Uh, I was so uh, excited about Stephen's last reply, I, I just couldn't keep track. <laughs> okay, well, this is a little bit... I guess I'm slightly confused by this one, but looking at like this... Um, I guess it's just like what I'm looking at is how it says, you know, look to the sky and see, you know... I guess it's like a metaphor saying looking, you know, look to like God. And it's like, if you sin, you know, what have you done against him? So it's like, I feel like it's just a continuation of kind of just like this rant right here. Like talking about, tr like trying to like continue to like put words, I guess, slightly in his mouth. But to just kind of compare him like against God about like in this righteousness thing that's going on. I'll stop comment now until after we break this down a little bit further. Okay. Well, he's he's making the point that uh, you know of the, the, the how great God is compared to Job and and any any man, and that uh, hey, Job, do you think that if if you commit a sin, it's somehow hurting God or affecting God, or do you think if you do something something good, something righteous, that it affects God? He say no. You know your your sins and your goodness only affects your fellow man, and it's not going to affect God. God's too great for you. Anything you do to have an effect on Him, that's his claim, and uh, and he's saying because God is sovereign. Now this word sovereign, of course, there's been a lot of verses already in Job where I've had to address the the problem with the word sovereign. Now first of all, the word sovereign does not appear one time in the KJV. Let's look at it. Uh, verse 8, uh, the translation in the Amplified says, but it cannot affect God who is sovereign. So let's look at verse 8 in the Amplified. Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the son of man. But it doesn't say anything there in the, in the uh, KJV about God being sovereign. So the writers of the Amplified have done what they're supposed to do. They amplified it. 
they put in their own comments, just like we're doing. We're amplifying the Bible in our discussion. They amplify it for us, giving us their thoughts on it. But verse 8 doesn't really say anything at all about God being sovereign. And the point that I want to make is that if you're someone that wants to put the sovereignty of God above every other uh, principle there is, every other theological principle, well, first thing I want you to know is the word sovereign is not even in the Bible one time, not in the KJV. I mean, you might find it in some other translations if you search enough of them, but the word sovereign is not there. Uh, so if if this this principle of sovereignty that, that that you rely on in Calvinism that God is controls every little thing in the universe every every thought of my mind God makes me think it every word that comes in my mouth God is actually making me say it everything I do God makes me do it I'm like a puppet or a robot that God's controlling that's that's the extent that a Calvinist takes the sovereignty of God. And man has no free will, not even even free thought. Uh, but that's not really what the sovereignty of God is in the Bible. The, the Bible says that God is omnipotent, which means that he's able to do whatever he wants to do. But he's not omnipotent in, in, in the respect that, or he is omnipotent, but he does not apply his omnipotence to control every thought, word, and deed of man. He gave us free will so we can think what we want and do what we want, and, uh, uh, and then we, we have to deal with it, with the, the law of reaping and sowing. And, but um, uh, this word sovereign, they, they put in the Amplified Translation, and I've noticed that many times throughout Job there are verses that a Calvinist might want to use to support their, their viewpoint on sovereignty of God. And uh, so God is sovereign in the respect that he's able to do whatever he wants, but he's also sovereign enough that he has the ability to say, I'm not going to control everything man does. I want man to have free will. That way man can choose to love me. If I control every thought, word, and deed, he can't choose to love me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, all right, but uh, before I go on, any thoughts on any of that? Well, Brother Luke, it sounds to me like the Calvinists have put Satan out of a job. Okay. Interesting comment right there about that. But, um, yeah. Well, I mean, looking back, you know, at these verses, you know, I guess it's like Elihu's trying to, I guess, to quote-unquote show Job how small he is, you know, in comparison to God and kind of like flatten him, at least in this sense. But going back to, like, the sovereignty, I mean... I know they also, like Calvinists will talk about like, predest like predestination and stuff like that. So I guess that this kind of ties into that because like with Calvinist sovereignty saying that you've been predestined, like your thoughts have been chosen to do this, you've been chosen to do that and all this stuff. But yet, you know, I feel like, you know, it's kind of weird though because like when it comes to their like doctrine, Actually, you know what? My th my mind's kind of gonna wa is wondering too much, so I'm just gonna ramble. So I'm just gonna stop right there. All right, we'll leave this subject of the sovereignty of God. And all I will say that is, if you are a Calvinist, if you're watching now, you are a Calvinist, or if you're somebody that doesn't understand what Calvinism is, to protect you from maybe being being fooled and deceived that to uh, become a Calvinist. Uh, I, I would invite you, encourage you, I'll urge you to watch my playlist, Calvinism Debunked, because Calvinism is, is one of the most evil philosophies ever invented in the history of mankind. Well, I, I have about 10 hours teaching that are refuting every aspect of Calvinism, so please watch that if you're even thinking about uh, becoming a Calvinist. All right. Uh, let's go on now. It says in verse 9, Because of the multitudes of oppressions, the people cry out. They cry for help because the violent arm of the mighty. But no one says, Where is God, my maker, who gives songs of rejoicing in the night? Who teaches us more than the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the heavens? The people cry out, but he does not answer because of the pride of evil men. 
Surely God will not listen to an empty cry which lacks trust, nor will the Almighty regard it. I'll stop there after verse 13. Uh, some pretty good stuff, but uh, once again, uh, not suitable for making doctrines out of. Okay. All right, well, looking at this again, I guess when you look, when it says the oppressed, I guess that kind of... Uh, I guess that kind of continues what we were talking about when it comes to like sovereignty, how it says like the oppressed, and they cry out against like the, as you said, I think it was the violent arm. I don't have the amplified in front of me, but um, one verse that stands out to me though, at least in the KJV, how it says in verse 13, surely God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. That kind of reminds me of something Jesus said actually in the New Testament when he was talking about the way to pray. When you're saying not to pray as the like the Pharisees do, how to not be out in the street or to use vain repetitions, and like, of course, right here he's using this, you know, at Job, but still, it's just kind of interesting how like because we've talked about this before, how like sometimes like it seems like things that Jesus say have you know seeped into this book. Well, there's one that seems like it seeped in right there about you know like vanity and not you know God you know not hearing it because as Jesus said. Those who pray in vanity have already had their reward in full. You know, in case, like, they're just trying to be honored like of men in that case. But I'll stop comment here until after we've broken this down a little bit more. Uh, well, th this is a, the, the, just a continuation of, of the, uh, the Elihu and the, the other three uh, so-called friends of Job that they've all been accusing Job of being wicked, and, and that's why God's punishing him. And this is all just a continuation of all that to teach Job. And what Elihu is emphasizing here basically is, look, uh, you, you need to repent. You need to get yourself right with God. Just admit you're, you're guilty. Repent, and then God will forgive you, and then maybe he can restore your life and get your life good again. But... Um, uh, that that's what he's persisting in. He he's not letting go of that theme because he's convinced that Job's problems are the result of his wickedness. It's punishment from God, and of course Job is having a real hard time with these charges because in Job's mind he really doesn't think he's he's uh, guilty, and 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 truly he's not. Uh, he's probably the best man in the world. Uh, we know in one chapter we, we, were, we were really impressed learning the greatness of Job, his accomplishments, how much he was admired, how many good things he's done, even the good thoughts he always had. It just He's just very, very impressive, and we, could, we certainly understood why God said, hmm, of all humanity, uh, let me pick Job. Try Here, Satan, here's the one I picked, Job. He loves me. He won't let me down. And uh, so... Job truly is righteous, uh, um, and that's why he was selected, and that's why this is so confusing for Job, and that's why his friends, because they don't understand, they're assuming that it's the, it's the law. If you're if you're being if you're being um, um, uh, you're sick, or you're in poverty, or you're uh, uh, you know your 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 life is is miserable. Everything is a failure in your life. It's got to be because you're a sinner and you're wicked, and, and God's just giving you what you deserve. That's the philosophy that they they hold, and so they think that well, Job, your family was killed, your property was destroyed, your wealth was taken away. You're so sick. You wish you were dead. Your your whole body's falling apart from boils from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. And, I mean, obviously, you're a wicked man. <laughs> That's what's happening to you. Um, I'll go on unless you want to expound on that anymore. Yeah, just a continuation, I guess, of the of like that, you know, just tirade that he's giving him. The only reason I mentioned what I did is just because. The wording just sounded very similar to what you know was said. I'm not saying that you know, like 
because the last time we talked about something like this was when Job was talking. But this time, you know, this is a rebuke. I'm just saying I just noticed something that just looks familiar. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I like that comparison. What do you think, Brother Luke? Well, there. The thing that really makes it difficult for people is that the principles that uh, Elihu is uh, uh, putting forth, and and also his other Job's three friends, the principles that they're teaching. One, they're very eloquent. The way they express it is just like, oh, they're so smart, they're so articulate, they're so passionate. And what they're saying, we know that this is the way the world works. You know, there is a law of reaping and sowing. And uh, so in, in some respects, it would be very easy for you to actually, them to win you over. And you think, well, Job deserves this. Job's a bad guy. And that's what happens. A lot of people end up misunderstanding, and they, get, they are actually won over by Job's accusers as they're studying Job. That's why we got to always remember, no, Job's innocent, and that uh, uh, it's it, it, the, these problems are not a result of his weaknesses as as they've gone on for like we're in chapter thirty five. There's probably been about twenty five chapters of the the, the friends. One cha every chapter is a long speech against Job. <laughs> okay, let me go on. Uh, Verse 14, I guess, is one. Uh, even though you say that you do not see him when missing his righteous judgment on earth, yet your case is before him, and you must wait for him. And now, because he has not quickly punished in his anger, nor has he acknowledged transgression and arrogance well, and seems unaware of the wrong of which a person is guilty, Job uselessly opens his mouth and multiplies its words without knowledge, drawing the worthless conclusion that the righteous have no more advantage than the wicked. Well, he just flat out called him a liar. Okay. Yeah, just pretty much just a continuation of just the same rant so far. Just... Pretty much talking about, you know, like coming to him, you know, just about, you know, judgment and stuff like that. Okay. Have you ever had to deal with the question? I mean, you want to tell people to trust Jesus, and they say, well, what I can't get over is tell me why bad things happen to good people. And then maybe I'll believe in your Jesus. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's the point. Is that uh, Job has been saying, I'm a good person, and yet these bad things are happening to me. Whereas people think or the, the rule is this law of reaping and sowing that Jesus talked about, that Paul talked about, and that these these uh, accusers of Job are all uh, saying, this is the way things work. You get what you deserve. And Job says, I'm a good person and bad things are happening to me. So I think that this would be, if a person could study Job, understanding that, look, here's something, all these bad things are happening to a good person, to a, the best man in the world, and yet bad things are happening to him. Uh, Someone, I made a video, uh, you know, I have a, in 2014, I had a lot of surgeries and hospitalization and, and stuff and had a lot of doctors and nurses dealing with them for six months or a year. And uh, One of the doctors, uh, we got very close and he he asked me what I, what I do in my spare time because he knew I was retired and I said, well, I, I spend a lot of time on the internet doing Christian ministry work. And he said, oh, that's interesting. So we started a dialogue. And then, of course, he said, look, I've seen that my problem is that 
you know, in my work, you know, I've seen so many bad things happen to good people. I mean, all there's all this evil things happening in the world. If God is good, why is he preventing it? And I said, well, uh, you know, I know that you've only allotted so much time in my appointment. <laughs> you know, you've got other patients. <laughs> That's the kind of question I can't answer in the brief amount of time that we have here. But so I ended up making a video um, to answer his question. And I have the video up. And uh, 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 I, I, I think the title of the video is, um, uh, I am happy God allows evil to exist. That's the title of the video. I'm happy God allows evil to exist. And I, the title is probably going to shock some people. But the point, the point is that if God did not allow evil to exist, then Brother Eric wouldn't be here now. Brother Stephen, you wouldn't be here either. I, certainly, I know I wouldn't be here. I'm glad he allowed evil to exist because we're all evil. Now, where man is a mixture of goodness and wickedness. But if God was to get rid of all evil in the world, there would not be no people left. He has to tolerate evil. Uh, and, you know, so uh, it, it, we, when we see evil like uh, the terrorists, the ISIS and these uh, crazy uh, Muslims that just want to kill everybody and burn them alive. We, we, we think of these the most horrible things. We say, that's really evil. But the, the evil, the, the things I've done in my life, I don't necessarily call it evil because it's all relativism. But the Bible says, with man, our righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So if, if you think you're really good and you know you're you're you know the bad things you do are just relatively bad, not as bad as the, the other guy, well guess what? It's it's all wickedness in God's sight. And thank you, Jesus, that you allow all of us who have all of us have wickedness in us, that you allow us to exist so that we can hopefully you'll come to the conclusion that you need Jesus. As as the three of us did. We've all came to the conclusion. That we need we need to be saved. We need the Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't even remember what verse we were talking about. Uh, why I got into that, but uh, go ahead and respond to that if you like. There's just a lot of good information in there. Uh, I'm just gonna have to go back and watch it again and again. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to check that video out too, but. Yeah, looking back at about, you know, God letting, you know, evil into this world and allowing it to exist. I mean, yeah, that question about, you know, bad things happening to good people, that's definitely thrown out a lot. But but really when you think about it, all of us definitely are wicked. As it, you know, Jesus said there's none righteous, you know, no not one. When we measure ourselves against God's righteousness, you know, all of us come short. You know, no matter how we try to spin it, you know, we're always going to be short because, you know, God is perfect. You know, he created this universe. You know, there's so much energy in it. But the thing is, there's never a time where the thing that was created is better than the creator. So, I mean, God is like almighty, you know, all-powerful, holy, perfect. And we're just a small creation. And, you know, we're nothing in comparison to him. So, like, anything that we might try to do that's, you know, good is still nothing in comparison to him. You know, and of course, and all of us, you know, sin and do, you know, evil things, you know, all the time. You know, I'm not saying we should, but, you know, as people, you know, we do. And, you know, all of us, if it wasn't for his mercy, then, you know, we'd be hopeless and we'd have nothing to go with. Because, you know, Jesus, you know, paid it all, and it's only through his righteousness that we have anything. So, I mean, I mean, yeah. Of course, Jesus also made points on you know this comment as well. I don't remember the exact verses, so I'm not going to state it unless I actually have it in front of me. But I mean, this is yeah. That's all I have for this. Well, I I hope you feel free that you don't have to quote a verse. You're you're free to paraphrase 
anytime you want to. A lot of times I think of a verse, and I can't quote the exact verse, but I can at least paraphrase it. Yeah, it's, um, with this one, it's just, I don't remember the exact wording of it, so I feel like I would completely screw it up. Like, if I at least, re like, mostly remembered the word, if I, like, well, it's like I remember, like, the words, but, like, I just don't, like, exactly remember it, so... Yeah, I'd have to it like if I if I had a chance to like have read the verse recently and I remembered it mostly, then I would have said it. But it's just this is just one where I kind of just had a brain fart and kind of forgot about it. All right, I don't uh, I didn't mean not necessarily in this verse, but any in the future, any time you feel like paraphrasing, uh, we're not I'm I'm not uh, one that says wait. I, I once said my first year on YouTube, uh, most of the people who follow me now on YouTube, I don't think that they've been with me for seven and a half years. There might be some people that watch my video that started seven and a half years ago. Um, but a lot of people have, you know, been watching my videos for a while. And, and uh, th this particular person, um, he seemed to be really enjoying, appreciating my videos, always making comments, always encouraging me. And then I said, uh, in one of my videos, I said, um, the wages of sin is death and hell. And uh, now, he he was real upset because he I, I, I uh, misquote, he says, it doesn't say that in the Bible. And I said, well, I, I wasn't quoting a verse. I didn't say... Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death and hell. It, if I was going to quote it, I would say the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But I wasn't quoting it. I'm just saying the Bible says certain things. It says that the wage of sin is death and because of sin we die and then we end up in hell. The Bible does say that, but it doesn't say that in one verse that I'm quoting word for word. But because I basically uh, was, I was just paraphrasing uh, a couple of doctrines, a couple of truths from the Bible in my own words, this person was highly offended because I said, the Bible says. I didn't say the Bible says, quote, unquote, you know. But that's how, how uh, nitpicking some people can be. But I'm, what I'm trying to tell you, Brother Stephen, is that I th I think, think it's perfectly okay. You know, if you want to paraphrase a verse in the, in the future, I don't feel like you have to, oh, I don't know that verse exactly right. Well, you just tell us what the verse means, and, and it'll be still be helpful. But, yeah, because the verse, I believe it was Jesus talking about, like, the sun shining on the wicked and, like, rain falling on it as well as the good. It's just the problem was I just don't remember the context of it. So it's just like... I was, I'm just a little bit unclear on it. So until I, like, had... Because, like, the way you had talked about, like, that verse, you were a little bit, you know, clearer on it than, I will, than like, I feel like I am. So that's the reason I didn't say it. But anyway, let's not, let's not waste too much time on this. We need to... we got more stuff to talk about. All right. Um, all right, so I'm going to reread the last couple of verses. And as I'm reading them, I want you to uh, just... Keep in mind the, the, the principles that we've been discussing here. Uh, one is that um, Job knows he's innocent. God, and the truth is, God declared him as righteous. And, uh, and yet these bad things are happening to him. And yet the, the common uh, principle that everybody accepted at that time, and it's still a true principle. I, I've called it the law of reaping and sowing, but I probably shouldn't even use that word, that term law, because uh, it doesn't say in the Bible the words, it's the law of reaping and sowing. It just the concept of reaping and sowing, the principle of reaping and sowing, is in the Bible. And that means that if you do good, you're going to get good back to you. It's like the, in, the, in the Eastern philosophy, what we call karma. You reap what you sow, you get karma. But uh, that's a principle. But it's not a law in that 
In other words, that every time you do something good, immediately you get a good result. And if something bad happens, it you you had to do something bad to to get that bad result. That would be a law. And that's how Job's friends are seeing everything. They're seeing this principle of reaping and sowing like it's a law. And Job, all these bad things were happening to you, so obviously you must be wicked. So uh, the question Job is, is dealing with is, well, I don't understand why then. Why are these things happening? Because, I mean, they think I'm wicked, but I, I know I, I'm not wicked. I've done nothing but good. So why are good things, bad things happening to a good person? And that's the question we've all asked ourselves in our lives. That's the question we all have to deal with when someone asks us about our faith. So keep that in mind as I read these last couple of verses over one more time here. It says, uh, even though you say that you do not see him when missing his righteousness, uh, uh, righteous judgment on earth, yet your case is before him, and you must wait for him. And now, because he has not quickly punished in his anger, nor has he acknowledged transgression and arrogance well and, se well and seems unaware of the wrong of which a person is guilty, Job uselessly opens his mouth and multiplies words without knowledge, drawing the worthless conclusion that the righteous have no more advantage than the wicked. Brother Luke, I really love how you connected the book of Job with the old classic, Why Does Bad Things Happen to Good People? I don't know why I never was able to make that connection. Uh, and now we have a very simple answer. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, well, remembering what like we were just talking about like before this and now looking at it, it's... Mm. It's a really big hit to, like, Job, and, like, really just, like, from what we said from the start, just kind of, like, evaluating, just, just a real, like, bad misinterpretation of, you know, like, Job's thoughts and, like, of what Job has done, pretty much. And that's pretty much, you know, all I have on here. Okay, now, uh, before we started this broadcast, we were talking about how short this chapter was and we anticipated we would probably get to the middle of the next chapter and I said well we can't predict sometimes you, you might just be studying just one or two or three verses could take an hour and so I, I, there's no telling how long it'll take but um, especially in these studies here I think that we you see that we all have the liberty to go off on some tangents sometimes and I think that's perfectly okay. I don't like things to be so rigid. Oh, you're off subject. We can't talk about that. That's not what we're talking about. So because of that, uh, we just were able to cover the one chapter. But I think we've done a thorough job of it. And we'll pick up with chapter 36 next time. But leading into uh, the conclusion of the broadcast, uh, we always conclude with the gospel, uh, with the good news that salvation is a free gift offered to you um, I have a video titled a free gift of theology and uh, the idea that uh, people go to heaven not because of, of uh, personal merit but because God offers salvation eternal life in heaven as a free gift to everyone who will trust Jesus uh, so this is how we want to conclude every broadcast, making sure you understand about this good news that salvation is a free gift. Uh, but leading into it, let me lay this foundation that uh, uh, the conclusion, concluding remark there is uh, that Elihu is making to Job is, uh, Job, you're, you're acting like uh, there's no reason for a person to be good because 
bad things can still happen to a good person. So what's the reason? Why not just be wicked? See, everything they're basing everything on um, on personal merit. You know, if you do good things, you should get good results. Now the problem is the world has taken that principle and they apply it to heaven. And if you ask if you ask anybody, just go around and start asking people, uh, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? And, and, and see what they say. You're going to find that almost everybody, and this is not just in the United States of America, this is all over the world. And this is not just in, in, in right now in history, this is throughout the history of the whole world. Almost everybody's, the philosophy of mankind has been that we go to heaven if we're good enough. And that's, that's the big fallacy. That's the big lie from the devil. If, if people think, well, the good people get to go to heaven, and if you're not good enough, you go, that, those people go to hell. Or people, some people say, well, most people go to heaven because they're not that bad. They're, the really bad people go to hell, and everybody else, they're pretty good people, so they get to go to heaven. But the, the error of that thinking is that heaven and hell is determined by personal merit. So we want you to understand that that, that you must reject that philosophy. That's not biblical. Uh, so if you can't get to heaven through personal merit, uh, because in order to go to heaven from personal merit, what you would have to do is you'd have to be able to go before God of the judgment and say, God, I'm perfect. I've never sinned one time. Because, see, the standard you have to meet is perfection. Are you able to go before God and say, he says, why should I let you in heaven? Say, well, I'm perfect. I've never sinned. I'm so good. I deserve heaven. You owe it to me. You're obligated to me. put me in heaven. You know, if you're that good, go ahead. You don't need Jesus then if that's what you think. But if you could admit that you're not perfect and that you cannot plead your case to God and say, I'm perfect. That's why I'm going to go to heaven. If you understand that that will not work, then, Brother Stephen, I want you to tell them the proper plea. What should they plead? What should they put their faith in for their salvation? All right. Well, as you said, a lot of people in this world definitely like to base things off their merit. I mean, especially, you know, salvation, thinking, you know, they're good enough or whether they're obedient enough or, you know, just whatever measure. But, you know, Jesus clearly said that, you know, everyone... None of us are righteous, you know, not one, and that our, you know, works are as filthy rags. You know, as he said in um, John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man will come to the Father but by me. Now, like, you know, the wages of sin is death, you know, and everyone has sinned. So, you know, all of us deserve hell. But the good news is that, you know, Jesus came, you know, to take away that penalty. He came, and you know, God in the flesh. He came in the form of a man, you know, down here to earth, and he lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. And but not only that, he wasn't just a human. You know, he was fully God at the same time. He fulfilled the law. He was pleasing to the Father. You know, he performed many miracles. You know, proved who he was. And but the best part was, he died. He was buried, and he rose again three days later. Now, when he rose again, he proved who he was because he said he had the power to take life and to give it. And he proved that by rising again. And but the, the most important thing was, though, he died and he shed his blood. And when he did that, he did that for you. He did that for me and for everyone, you know, for all the sinners. Because we can't pay our own way. And there's no other way apart from Jesus, as I just said in you know, John 14, 26. You know, Jesus paid it all. On the cross, and He offers the gift to us freely, you know, if we come to Him, you know, not by our own ways, but to Him. As it says, you know, in John 6:47, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on Me, you know, hath everlasting life." Matthew 18:11, "For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost." You know, He came here for us to give us that gift, and the, and all we have to do to receive the gift is believe. You know, we are talking about works. Here's another verse. And John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. 
All we have to do to be saved you know, is believe. And we have salvation. And of course we have the Holy Spirit as well. And also the best part about salvation is you're always secure in it. As it says in John 10.28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's the best part. No matter what happens, you'll, let's say nothing can pluck you from his hand. You always have everlasting life because Jesus gave it to you as a gift. And all you have to do is receive it. And to receive it, work the work of God, all you have to do is believe. Just come to him and believe and have faith. You know, it's so simple, but the world likes to, a lot of times, just complicate it. But all you have to do, there is no other way as well. All you can do is believe on Jesus. Not by your own merit, not by believing in anything other else, not by your own obedience. And of course, a lot of people say this, not by you know, your own baptism. Even. Don't trust in the water. Only trust in Jesus because he paid it all. So just come to him. You know, as I know I'm looking here at Brother Luke's picture of the nail scarred hand of Jesus reaching out to somebody. All you have to do is just simply, you know, reach out to Jesus. Believe in him. He'll save you. And, you know, and that's all I have on the gospel. All right. Uh, the, uh, what we've been telling you here at the end of this broadcast uh, is what I call biblical Christianity. It's, it's the Christianity you find in the Bible. Now, if you go to most churches in America, most churches around the world, you're not going to hear this kind of a message, unfortunately. That because the Christianity that you your most people experience is not biblical at all. Now, so what we're telling you is that your salvation is not based upon how religious and how good you can be. Your salvation is based upon how good Jesus is. He's so good, he he give you eternal life and have it as a gift if you trust him. That's what the Bible says. Now, to prove it, I will put all the verses that you need to really understand in the description box of this video. So I invite you at the end of the video to uh, read the verses uh, that will explain this so that you're, you understand that Brother Stephen and I, this is not just our own particular philosophy that we just invented. This is what we're telling you is what the Bible says Christianity is. Okay, and I want to give the last word here to Brother Eric. Thanks, Brother Luke and Brother Stephen. What a blessing. And uh, why wouldn't we want to thank God for this great salvation? Let's go ahead and do that. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and being buried and rising again the third day so we can spend eternity with you in paradise and all our loved ones as well in Jesus name amen okay now if you're wondering what uh, you need to do next uh, you can start by loving your neighbor as yourself it's very important okay back to you guys okay well done brothers uh, so trust Jesus says, trust him completely, and he guarantees you're going to go to heaven. Yeah, that should make you smile. Uh, thank you, brothers, for participating, uh, and thank you for watching the video. Uh, please join us live nightly at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.